Hello, welcome to this short film on discharging patients on anticoagulation from the ward into the community. It is the fourth in a series of films um, and it is aimed at every healthcare professional involved in this process. My name is Rebecca Locke and I am an anticoagulation nurse specialist. And I'm Carol Law and I'm a thrombosis education advisor and I've been delivering courses in anticoagulation, thrombosis and thrombosis prevention for over 20 years with Rebecca. We're delighted to be presenting this, this fourth film in the series focusing on discharging patients who have prescribed anticoagulation from hospital on behalf of Thrombosis UK and the National Nursing and Midwifery Network for VTE Prevention. When someone is discharged on an anticoagulant, the aim is to ensure a safe transfer to the community. In order to do so, there are some key things that we need to consider. And these are education, referral to the anticoagulation service and support at home. Clearly, nurses need to have this knowledge and understanding in order to be able to share it with the patient. And and the three previous films in this series have included relevant information which will help with this. NICE, in their key therapeutic topic 16, say that all healthcare professionals dealing with patients with anticoagulation should have had education about them. So that education on anticoagulation and VTE is important, not just for the patient but for the nurse as well. On this slide you can see some examples of resources that can be used to support education for patients. It's really important that we consider the information that we give to our patients and that the resources that we, we use support what we say. So when we're planning our education, it's not only the content, but the resources that we need to think about. So let's have a think about some of the information to start off with. We've identified some red flags that patients must definitely be aware of before they're sent home. So sh patients should know they must report bleeding, any unexpected bruising, signs and symptoms of an extension of a DVT and signs and symptoms of a pulmonary embolism and return of symptoms. To get a better understanding of that, we recommend that you watch the first film in this series, which will explain those in detail. So when we're talking to patients, it's fine to know that there are red flags, but how we describe to the patient what they are and how to deal with them are also very important. Now, with anticoagulation, particularly warfarin, if a patient's sent home on it, they are very prone to having nosebleeds. And patients need to know that if a nosebleed lasts for more than 10 minutes, they should um, call for help. Now, they should be timing that um, they should be timing that nosebleed from the start to finish so they have an accurate idea of how long it is and whether or not it's stopping or starting. Severe or prolonged bleeding from the gums, they need to contact um, the dentist for advice. If they have blood in their vomit or, in, or, or their spit, they need to talk to their um, GP or to the ward or to the emergency um, department. If they're passing blood in their urine, or they've had recent onset of black feces or stools, they need to contact medical um, help. They need to um, notify their doctors if there's severe bruising or extensive bruising for no reason. If they have unusual headaches, that's significant. If they have unexplained or significant increase in dizziness, tiredness, paleness or weakness, they need to um, flag that and for women heavy or increased bleeding during their period or any other vaginal bleeding so when you tell patients that they need to be aware of bleeding um you need to you don't want to over frighten them but you do need to tell them that um some simple first aid for some of this so if they cut themselves they need to apply pressure and elevate as you would tell any patient um, but they may need to apply that pressure for longer because they're anticoagulated and they're going to stay, take longer to stop bleeding. 
if they have nosebleeds, it's a good idea, as I said earlier, to time the nosebleed. If it lasts for 15 minutes or more, they need to seek medical help. They may need to, and that needs to be urgent, so they need to ring for um, an ambulance. Um, it's a good idea if they do have a bad nosebleed to suck either an ice cube or an ice lolly, and that will reduce um, the, the size of the blood vessels in the nose and constrict, and that will also reduce bleeding. So these simple techniques are quite helpful when sending patients home. And if somebody is already prone to something like nosebleeds and you're giving them an anticoagulant, anticoagulant, then you definitely need to reinforce this first aid. If you're asking a patient to get medical help, they need to have, be given permission to do that. So they should be phoning 999 if they're involved in a major accident or if they have a significant blow um, injury or a blow to the head, or if they are bleeding and they're unable to stop the bleeding. They can get more simple advice from their local anticoagulation clinic and GPs or by phoning 111. Um, and there needs to be contact for an, when patients are discharged, they need to be given advice about who to contact, emergency numbers, and what to do out of hours. So on discharge, patients need to be given a, a clear understanding of, of the anticoagulation that they are on. So there should be a discussion with the discharging pharmacist or nurse about how to use the anticoagulants, about how long to take the anticoagulants, possible side effects and what to do if they occur, how other medication, for example, food and alcohol may interfere with certain of those anticoagulants, any monitoring that's needed for their anticoagulation treatment, how anticoagulants may affect their dental treatment. They need some reassurance about taking anticoagulants if they are planning a pregnancy or become pregnant. They shouldn't, um, they should be very cautious and talk to med medical personnel if they do get pregnant or they're planning to get pregnant. How anticoagulants may affect activities such as sports and travel, where and how to seek medical help. And this information that's given verbally should be reinforced with written information because as soon as the patients get home, they'll think, what did that nurse say to me? What did that pharmacist say? And on discharge, they need to have a, a record somewhere in the notes that the education has in fact taken place so that you can audit that the... the um, that the care that you're giving is up to the appropriate standards. In addition to the information outlined by NICE um, for anticoagulation to pay anticoagulated patients, patients must know to carry their patient alert card, whether or not they're on um, warfarin or a do DOAC. They should know how to perform the first aid for the management of bleeding. They need to know that there will be a follow-up when that is, where it is, what the date is, what the time is. They need to know about alerting healthcare professionals of anticoagulation for if they're going to have future hospital and procedures or treatment. They need to know how to get um, repeat prescriptions um, and that they should go to their GP for those. They need to know how to take the tablets as prescribed. And if there's gonna be a difficulty with that, they need to have, um, um, maybe a dosset box as, as I call them, where, the, where the, the tablets can be put. They need to know to report symptoms of bleeding and other side effects. Any signs and symptoms of a DVT or pulmonary embolism. What to do if they miss a dose, because patients do forget and it can be very frightening if you've forgotten not knowing what to do in those circumstances. And they also need to know what, um, that when they go to the chemist, what that they need to inform the chemist because there are drugs that will interact with the anticoagulants that they have been prescribed. So there are some very special considerations for warfarin. The blood will be checked taking the INR with a blood test, which stands for International Normalized Ratio. It's important to know that if the INR is high, your blood is taking longer to clot, and so you will bleed more easily. Whereas if the INR is 
low, the figure is low, your blood is, is quicker to clot, and so you won't bleed very well at all. Your changes in your dose of warfarin are based on what your INR is. So depending on whether or not it's high or low, your dose will be altered. This will be done in clinic, and so the patient needs to know how that's going to be managed, where the clinic is, how the, the clinic is managed, when their appointments are. They need to be aware that if they have any changes in their other medication, they must inform whoever is managing the anticoagulation of these changes. They must know that diet can impact on their warfarin levels, as can alcohol. They should be given the yellow warfarin book, which has all of this information in it, and will, keep, will be a place where they can keep a record of their INR changes and the changes to their dosage. They also need to know that warfarin cannot be put in their dosage boxes because it will change too frequently. So lastly, it's important that if a patient is taking warfarin, they should not get pregnant. Um, warfarin is very damaging to the unborn baby and they can be born with disability. So a patient who is in the age group that can get pregnant, if they're on warfarin, should be advised not to get pregnant. Or if they want to get pregnant, they must discuss this at length with their consultant haematologist. With the direct oral anticoagulants or DOEX, there are some special considerations too. The patient will need to be regularly reviewed. This will probably be done in the community where they will check their renal and liver function on a fairly regular basis. They will have um, recordings of their haemoglobin and also like warfarin, any changes in medication need to be informed to whoever the healthcare professional is who's managing their care. They must not breastfeed whilst on a DOAC and pregnancy is also a problem. So if they do become pregnant, they must talk to their um, whoever's managing their care because they need to be taken off the DOAC and put on low molecular weight heparin. There are four types of DOACs that patients may um, be prescribed. Um, Apixaban, Edoxaban, Dibicotran and Rivaroxaban. The doses differ depending on what the drug is, so you must check correctly for your patient which DOAC they're on, therefore which dose they're on. And the doses also differ depending on why the patient is on a DOAC, so whether or not it's for VTE or whether or not it may be for AF, or whether or not it might be for another reason. Remember, individual patient information leaflets are available for each DOAC, and each DOAC has a specific patient information leaflet depending on the condition. Do not give patients who have had a DVT or PE the patient information leaflet designed for use in atrial fibrillation, for example. And remember, the dosage for DOACs prescribed in AF is different from that in VTE. So as we've talked about in film three, self-administration of low molecular weight heparin is very important. And to do it correctly, you need to be taught the correct technique. There is a film on Thrombosis UK website, which looks at this. And it's very important that it's done properly. If you come across a, a, a lot of patients on your ward who've got a lot of bruising on their abdomen, this means that you're not doing the technique properly. Some key things to remember is always pinch the skin before you inject. Inject the needle at 90 degrees to the surface of the skin. Keep the pinch whilst you take the needle out, then release and do not rub the injection site after you've given the injection. It's important to tell the patient that because sometimes these injection sites are quite itchy and if they scratch that will cause bru ble bruising. Patients before they go home need to know how to dispose of their syringes. They should be supplied with a shards box. Each area has a different procedure for picking up those sharp boxes, so you need to know what yours is. 
um, they need to have had the anticoagulation education and they need to have been given the appropriate patient information leaflet. Patients need to be aware that heparins are of animal or origin, but synthetic alternatives are available. And uh, this needs to be discussed in detail with the patient if that's a problem. So patients on discharge need to be referred to an anticoagulation clinic for the ongoing management of their anticoagulation. And this is the point where care can fall down. It's often because of poor communication between the hospital and primary care or the clinic anticoagulation clinic in the hospital. So we need to make sure that the correct information is given in a timely manner to the clinic. So in order to do that, we need to understand where our local anticoagulation clinics are, and then also to think about what a good referral looks like. So we now need to have a look at some of the key points for referral for patients who are discharged on warfarin and some who are discharged on a DOAC. When the referral first arrives in the anticoagulation clinic, it might actually be dealt with by the clerical staff. So you need to put a lot of, make sure all the correct information is on that referral so it can be processed appropriately. When the patient actually arrives in the clinic, they might not be aware of their full history or be able to communicate that appropriately. So that information needs to be within the referral and, and often the anticoagulation clinic's database isn't, you, isn't linked to the hospital record. So you can't assume that you can just tap into the patient's net file and find that information. If it's not there on the referral, it might be a while before that filters through to the clinic. The anticoagulation clinic also really is really important that they know what the dosing re regime and the corresponding INRs were for that patient while they were in hospital. So you need to make sure that the yellow book and or dosing sheet is filled in correctly um, and that there is a process for ensuring the INR is going to be measured um, post-discharge and on the day of discharge because it's not going necessarily going to be done daily once they once they go home. If the patient's already on an anticoagulant when they were admitted to hospital, then we need to make sure that they're discharged to the anticoagulation service that they came from. So that, that might be to the, uh, to the, back to their gen GP or to the hospital's anticoagulation service. So we don't want to have them going to two clinics. We need to make sure that we, the care is seamless. If you're not sure what to do, then contact the anticoagulation service that, that, because they will be pleased to help you to ensure that that care does follow on seamlessly. For the patient, we need to make sure that they know what dose to take when they are discharged and when their next dose is going to be. For a patient on a DOAC, the situation is very similar. We need to remember that, that it might be the clerical staff who are dealing with that initial appointment, that they might not know their full history and be a patient, uh, and able to communicate it, that the database isn't necessarily going to be linked to the anticoagulation record, and that the clinic still needs to know the hospital dosing regime. Uh, they need to know the patient's renal and liver function tests. So we're not going to be worried about the INR for these patients, but the clinic still does need to understand what the patient's baseline results were and what they were on, dis on discharge. And again, if the patient is already on a DOAC before they're admitted, they need to be referred back to the same service. And the patient still needs to know the dose that they're being <coughs> discharged and when their next referral to the clinic is likely to be. A lot of problems happen when patients go into hospital on one anticoagulant, for example, warfarin, and then whilst in hospital are switched to another anticoagulant, usually a DOAC. It's incredibly important that the person, that the team looking after a patient's anticoagulation in the community or in outpatients are aware of this change. So ensure that the discharge referral letter to the community clearly states the switch has happened and follow up has been arranged. Give full details of the DOAC prescribed, including the date commenced, the dosage, and when it's to be reviewed. 
ensure the patient knows that warfarin must not be taken after discharge and to dispose of any warfarin tablets, ensure family, carers, community support, the care home are all aware that the switch has taken place and that warfarin must no longer be given. And if patients has a dosset box to inform the community pharmacist so that the DOAC can be added to it, because DOACs do go into dosset boxes. Now, there are lots of case studies where patients have been double dosed. So they were on warfarin, they go into into hospital, they're started on a DOAC, nobody tells the community staff. So when the patient comes home, they continue with the warfarin and the patient just carries on taking the DOAC. So they are double anticoagulated. So you can be sure that that's when they're going to have a terrible problem. They're going to have bleeding, some disaster is going to happen. So please, can you make sure that switching is done safely and um, patients are kept safe? because this is an absolutely dangerous situation to be in. So in order to ensure that this happens safely, then we really need to have a good local protocol that actually documents the process for making that transfer from hospital to community for somebody who's been prescribed an anticoagulant. So therefore, if you can have good links with your local anticoagulation services and know where they are, who the people are within them, this can help that process. So it's a good idea if, to get to know your local anti your no anticoagulation nurse specialist because that nurse will understand those links and will be able to support you through that process. Within that protocol, it should be clear who is responsible for, make, for that prescription on discharge, to be clear how many doses the patient will receive and how many repeat prescriptions will be managed so that there isn't a delay in anticoagulation when the patient goes home. Once a patient is at home, it can be quite scary. If they've been in hospital having had a pulmonary embolism in particular, and now they're being discharged on a drug for, for which there's an awful lot of information, they, will, they, might, they need to have some sort of um, support and resources available to them. They will have their family and carer uh, as carers, and if they have that information, that can be a resource. But for the patient uh, and, and their family, what else is there out there? So there might be some local support groups for somebody who's had um, a VTE and is on an anticoagulant, but also on the Thrombosis UK website, there's a lot of information that patients can be referred to, and that can provide quite a nice safety net. I would recommend that you watch a short video from the most recent um, National and Nursing Midwifery Study Day that took place as part of um, the Thrombosis UK um, study, study week, um, where Emma G interviewed a patient called John about his experience of being discharged following a pulmonary embolism. And it is, becomes very clear that patients do need support at home. They do need someone to know where those resources are and that it is part of the discharge process to ensure that that is available to them. Some patients um, recently have been, who have had pulmonary embolisms are discharged early. In the past, all pulmonary embolism patients were admitted and, and then treated as an, as an admitted patient. But there is now um, a PESI scoring system whereby patients are risk stratified to see how severe their pulmonary embolism is and whether or not they can be treated at home. Patients uh, can then be managed, if they, if they score zero, they can be managed as an outpatient on a PE pathway, which should be reviewed by a clini senior clinical decision maker before going home. I think that this is a very much a clinical driven decision and it's terribly important particularly for the nurses and pharmacists involved to remember that the social and um, community aspects of that patient's life also need to be taken into account not just what they've scored on a clinical risk so are they being 
Do they have care at home? Are they a long way from the hospital? Do they understand the signs and symptoms? Are they likely to run into trouble if this pulmonary embolism extends or gets worse? It's not just a very simple clinical decision. They live on their own, they're elderly, they're frail. They live miles from the hospital. It might not be a good decision, however low their risk. What we want to do is to ensure that when somebody is discharged on an anticoagulant, they remain safe. So we can think of the anticoagulant as being the hazard. So that's the risk for the patient. And what we want to do is to block off those holes on that piece of Swiss cheese so that there are no losses suffered. And so in, with an anticoagulant, that would be the patient having a bleed or another clot. So what can we do? Well, we need to make sure that we have a protocol in place that actually reflects best practice for, in terms of a discharge on anticoagulation. We need to ensure that patients have appropriate education prior to discharge and that the staff who are facilitating that discharge also have the appropriate knowledge and understanding in order to teach the patients and that the resources to support that education are in place. We need a good <clears throat> referral to the anticoagulation clinic so that there's a smooth transfer into the community and that the patient doesn't have a gap in their anticoagulation between leaving hospital and being picked up by their care in the anticoagulation clinic. And there needs to be appropriate support and resources for the patient when they're at home and that they know where to go for that support should they need it. Here are some of the references that we've used while we've been um, talking through and you're help, happy to go and have a look at those to have a little bit more information. And we've also included some learning resources. There, there's a, a video that Rebecca has referred to of um, Miranda Hobson demonstrating how to give low molecular weight heparin, which is useful for both us as healthcare professionals and to refer your patient to as a, an aid memoir. There are a variety of patient information leaflets, both on Thrombosis UK website, um, and, on, and, and specific ones for individual drugs that the patients are prescribed. And if you do nothing else as a follow-up to this, I would recommend looking at some patient stories. There are a variety on Thrombosis UK website and, inclu and including the one about John that I mentioned earlier. But you could also go and look at um, one from Paul Robinson, who, and I think that, um, who was the ex uh, Blackburn and England goalkeeper, and, and who look, talks about the whole uh, impact of having an event as well, although it's not specifically about discharge. And then some things to look at in your practice that might help improve the quality of anticoagulation discharge are to think about, does your trust have a policy for discharging patient on anticoagulation? Are the key things that we've discussed during this webinar in there? And do you have specific patient information leaflets for patients being discharged on warfarin, apixaban, dipigatran, adoxaban, and rivaroxaban in VTE? Because they need to have the information that relates specifically to their drug and their condition. And do they reflect local contemporary practice? And then finally, you might want to take a look at the notes of five patients who've been discharged on an anticoagulant and see whether you feel they meet the criteria for a safe discharge. And if not, you might want to actually to think about why that was and conduct a practice development little a project to explore this issue so that we can put safe practice in place to have patients discharged safely on anticoagulation. Thank you very much for listening to the fourth in this series of films. We hope it will be useful and that you will be able to take it forward and uh, make your practice safer. <laughs>